inspiration for writing my St Cuthbert Oratorio quite early on in my life, although I might not have realised it at the time. I grew up in Durham in the northeast of England, and for those of you who've been there, you'll know that there's a, an incredibly beautiful uh, cathedral at the centre of the city, and it's uh, very iconic. And growing up in that city, it's an inescapable part of your life. Uh, and this was a building that I visited uh, to look at it from a historical point of view. We visited it to attend services there. I sang there with one of the parish choirs on a regular basis. And I also uh, got to hear a lot of big choral works performed in Durham Cathedral by local choral societies. And I have this strong memory of how it felt to be in the space hearing these works. And I like to use the phrase, making the space ring, because that's my memory of what it was like listening to these pieces in this magnificent space. There was a sense that the choir and the brass and the strings and the soloists uh, were swirling round in, in this space, making uh, this amazing sound, which could be massive, and kind of engulf you, or it could be very intimate, and you could just hear a, a solo voice ringing uh, through the building in a haunting kind of a way. So St Cuthbert is buried in Durham Cathedral and the oratorio that I wrote with Ben Dunwell in 1995 tells the story of the saint's life, his life living uh, on Lindisfarne and becoming Bishop of Lindisfarne and finally dying in 687. Uh, and then his body was taken as a shrine on uh, a pilgrimage for about 150 years around the northern part of England, um, particularly in response to the increased Danish Viking raids on the Northumbrian coast. So in an effort to keep the shrine safe, the monks uh, of Lindisfarne kept moving the body of St Cuthbert. And eventually in 995, the body came to the site of Durham and that is where it has remained until this day. So for 995 the Shrine of St Cuthbert has been in Durham and now of course there is this very uh, wonderful cathedral built there. So before I start writing music down, I'm aware of the piece that I'm trying to write. But it's not in specific musical terms. I'll be aware of the textures of the music. So with a work like St Cuthbert, I'm beginning to hear the sound of fanfares, um, voices ringing in the space, operatic solo voices kind of soaring over the textures. I'm starting really from how it feels to experience this piece, even before I've written any of the notes. And that's always been the way for me into music, is to try and have this um, pre-music, if you like, which is not specific notes, it's not specific chords or rhythms or anything. It's a sense of what the piece is going to be like. The next stage is to start to inhabit this world um, with actual musical shapes and harmonies. And I do this mainly at the piano, thinking about different harmonies, different moments in the story that I'm going to be telling in a musical way. And one of the very uh, strong pieces of material in St Cuthbert is this fanfare theme, 
which was one of the first pieces of material that I put together. It goes like this. And it very strongly gives an indication of the Dorian minor scale. And the Dorian minor scale is a beautiful, bright sounding scale. And there are lots of possibilities using that harmony to write um, open sounds, bright sounds. Um, and in the story of Cuthbert, of course, there are moments of great light and brightness. And it seemed that this would be music that could work for that. There are other aspects of the story which are the opposite of light. They are the darkness. And Cuthbert talks uh, in a number of points in the oratorio about facing the darkness, facing fear, and praying to God for guidance and for hope. I needed something much more tortured, uh, chromatic, something that was less certain than that fanfare to try and depict that. <laughs> musical shapes. One of the things I particularly love about the piano is that there's a visual layout of the notes um, and you can see shapes very well on the piano and the way I learned the instrument really was thinking about the shapes and how they replicated on the instrument, how you could transpose shapes uh, and the different effects you could get um, depending on how close together notes are or how far apart notes are. There's a very sonorous sound in music, the major triad, and it has a lovely warmth and richness and strength and is very positive. And in that chord there are some good distances between the notes. There's the first note, there's the second, there's the third. So you get this rich, um, secure, open sound. The opposite of that is to jam notes much more closely together. So something like this. Again, it's three notes, but they're very close together. And we call that kind of harmony chromatic harmony. And in St Cuthbert and in all of my music, I like to find um, the edges of the music. I like to find where I'm going to be at the most chromatic and where I'm going to be at the most sonorous. And St Cuthbert, which is a story which deals with darkness and light, uh, fear and redemption, um, lends itself to this way of thinking. So there are areas in the oratorio where the harmonies are very bright and strong, like the major chord there, and there are other points where it's much more tortured.
dances with me. In the first movement, the call, um, following a, an orchestral prelude, we hear the soprano soloist, who is the, the angel character in the oratorio, singing the words, blessed and glorified, holy servant of God. And she begins this movement with those words, and the movement is all about Cuthbert being called to be Bishop of Lindisfarne. there is a storm. It begins with St Cuthbert praying to God for strength um, and he recalls an earlier event in his life where as a young man he saw monks on the water uh, and a storm come up and the waves get so massive that the monks, it appeared that the monks would be drowned. And he relates that a crowd of people on the shore um, are mocking the monks and saying that their Christ is not strong enough to protect them from the waves. And Cuthbert kneels and prays and calms the storm. In the third movement, the soprano and the chorus reflect on the behaviour of the people in the storm movement that precedes it. The orchestra for this piece is pretty large, um, a full string section, four horns, 
three trumpets, three trombones and a tuba, um, a big amount of percussion, harp uh, and also the organ in the cathedral is used. So at its loudest uh, this piece is uh, incredibly big and resonates uh, when you hear it performed. Uh, that doesn't mean of course that I'm using those massive textures all the time. There are solo sections of course, solo singers and the scoring is much lighter uh, a lot of the time around those singers. And part of the um, method really of making a successful orchestration is making sure that your piece is moving between lighter sounds and into bigger sounds and that there's a movement between those two things. So moving from quiet to loud either suddenly or gradually uh, and in the other direction as well from loud to quiet is one of the fantastically powerful tools you've got when you have uh, a large orchestration. Now Cuthbert actually started with a slightly smaller orchestration than the one uh, on the Halle recording. Um, it was first performed in 1995 and at that time, for financial reasons, uh, we did that with a, a smaller um, ensemble. We had um, eight brass instruments, percussion, uh, and we used amplified keyboards and a solo cello, solo flute and solo clarinet. So I was able to, in that orchestration, suggest big textures, but on a smaller number of players. Um, in that first performance, the then um, director of the choristers at Durham Cathedral, James Lancelot, um, performed on the organ. And afterwards he asked me if I'd be interested in extending the orchestration so that he could perform it with Durham University Choral Society the following year. And so that's the version that uh, now exists, this fully orchestrated version. And I'm hugely grateful to the Choral Society and to James for allowing me the opportunity to, um, in a sense, realise what I wanted to realise, which was this full symphonic um, oratorio texture uh, that I hadn't been able to quite achieve in the first version. opens with a movement called Lindisfarne and the first thing we hear is these voices emerging in many parts and in fact uh, there are 16 solo parts for the chorus. There's a main chorus part and 16 soloists and the idea is that through the, the stacking of the voices we get this sense of the oscillating tides around the island of Lindisfarne the kind of spiritual nature of time passing with the tide and the observance of things from the natural world. When I'm writing uh, a new piece, there's a mixture of uh, emotions. Uh, on the one hand, I'm incredibly excited that I'm going to be writing a new piece, making new sounds and performing with a new set of performers. That's really exciting. On the other hand, there's this kind of fear of the unknown because you don't yet know what it is that they're going to, um, to sing or play and uh, that tension between the excitement of um, what you, you're hoping to create versus uh, slight fear about not having created it yet um, 
is a really fascinating part of the artistic journey and most people who ever make anything will recognise that um, spectrum of emotion. So one of these shapes that is going on throughout the piece is the fanfare. And you'll hear that at the very start of the oratorio and at the very end. And in the final movement, which is called Prayer, we hear the chorus singing this as a kind of fugue. Uh, it's not a true fugue in an academic sense, but uh, the music builds up in a stack and there is a second part to uh, the fugue. So they suddenly the music becomes more up-tempo. 